Um, female antagonists were not new in the second half of the 19th century, as they have often embodied uh, men's sexual frustrations, unrequited love, lack of control over the beautiful sex of themselves, or simply the most familiar, familiar other woman. We all know the story of Medusa the Gorgon, who turned men to stone after she had herself been turned into a monster as a punishment for being raped by Poseidon in the temple of Athena. She was ultimately beheaded by Perseus as a rite de passage, turning him into a man or perhaps another monster. Percy Shelley redeems uh, her in his ecstasy of an actually Flemish painting on the Medusa of Leonardo in 1819 by objectively describing her, I quote, as a woman's countenance with serpent locks, with some beauty rather than, rather than a monster and portraying her as a victim of violence and prejudice. Uh, I quote again, it is the melodious hue of beauty thrown athwart the darkness and the glare of pain which humanize and harmonize the strain. The Lamia is another uh, snaky demon that John Keats uh, turns into a victim in Lamia in 1818. Like the vampire, she penetrates the civilized home of young Licious, but is destroyed by his master, the sophist Apollonius, a precursor to Baron Vanderberg and Van Helsing, who not only embodies reason, but a form of heartless inquisition. The young romantics side with the female demon because she's an outcast, a victim of power, an embodiment of nature, passion, and the imagination endangered in the age of reason and industrialization. Even before those um, Greek demons, um, sirens, humanities, or witches like Circe or Medea, the Akkadian Lamashtu already penetrated the domestic sphere to feed on infants or unborn babies, an obvious personification of disease and, or an infant mortality, while the Lilitu, from the Sumerian Lil, meaning wind spirit specter, who later became the blood-drinking Lilith, is a succubus who, according to uh, Frank Wingerman, whom I'm quoting now uh, in his study uh, uh, on the Lamashtu, was, uh, um, uh, a creature who died in a state of virginity and never knew the pleasures of lovemaking and family life. Trying to make up for their unsat unsatisfactory lives, they visit the living at night and select a mate. Disease, the penetration at night of the domestic sphere, endangering social order and sexual libido, are part and parcel of modern vampirism, especially in Lefanus Carmilla, where the demon is female. Robert Salvi was perhaps the first English author to portray a female vampire, Oneza, in his orientalist tale, Thalaba the Destroyer, published in 1801. However, apart from the Christian-like spear used to uh, exorcise her, announcing the stake in Carmilla and Dracula, Oneza has less to do with vampires than with accusing the accusing ghosts of betrayed women in Gothic literature, like the bleeding nun in Matthew Lewis's The Monk, published in 1795. Oneza is above all a revenant, and although Laura uses the term to refer to Carmilla, she also says in uh, Le Fanus novel that the deadly pallor attributed to, the, to that sort of revenants is a mere melodramatic fiction. They present in the grave the appearance of healthy life. Salve's note uh, may to the poem may have proved more useful, even if Le Fanu also used other sources, probably um, Augustin Calmet, uh, his tra Traité sur les apparitions des esprits et sur les vampires, ou les revenants de Moravie et de Hongrie, since Le Fanu refers to Moravia. Here are the elements used in Carmilla. Firstly, the epidemics um, uh, in the villages on the borders between Hungary and uh, uh, Transylvania in Romania, uh, especially um, uh, one uh, caused by a, a vampire named Arnold Paul, who uh, claimed uh, to have been molested by a vampire. Secondly, uh, the appearance of the vampire in the grave, I quote, they found his eyes open, his color fresh, his respiration quick and strong, yet appeared to be stiff and insensible, which is reproduced in Carmilla. 
Thirdly, the method of execution with the stake, uh, the pyre, etc. There's also uh, the idea that the first attempt to er eradicate the evil did not work out. And above all, uh, Salve mentions a female victim. So I'm quoting uh, from his notes. Uh, Amongst others, there was one Stanoska, the daughter of a high duke, whose name was Jovitso, who, going to bed in perfect health, waked in the middle of the night and, making a terrible outcry, affirmed that the son of the certain Hay Duke, whose name was Milo, and who had been dead about three weeks, had attempted to strangle her in her sleep. She continued from, from that time in a languishing condition and in the space of three days died. This announces the story of Laura, uh, uh, or even the young Milarka, whose name somewhat echoes Milo's, as the Baron Vordenberg reveals that she herself, I quote, was haunted by one of these demons in chapter 15. The impression of strangulation in a sleep is indeed what Laura felt, and even more so, Bertha Spilsdorf, who actually died. In Le Fanu's novel, the Swineherd's wife reports a similar impression, I quote, she thought something seized her by the throat and as she lay in a bed and nearly strangled her. She was quite well the day before, she sank, she sank afterwards and died before a week. Before Le Fanu, John Polidori had already revalued Savi's anecdote by emphasizing young women as the vampire's select victims. Robert Savi thus appears to provide Le Fanu with technical details as to vampirism, and an early example of female vampire, while Shelley and Keats showed an inspiring sympathy for female demons, or at least a resistance to prejudice and judgment. However, those stories are heterosexual, or at least undiscriminating, if we considered that Arnold Paul sucked men, women, children, adults, and beasts alike. Particular attention must therefore be turned to another romantic poem showing a female demon preying on a female victim, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's uh, Christabel. In his study of, the, of fateful women in literature, Mario Prats describes Carmilla as, a, quote, a kind of fairy transposition of a lesbian love affair not unlike Coleridge's Christabel. And this was published in uh, 1937. So Christabel is a poem begun uh, in 1797 and completed in 1800, but only published in 1816. Although she's not necessarily a vampire, Geraldine is indeed an even more relevant prototype of Carmilla, as Arthur Nevercott already suggested in a paper published 10 years after the Italian edition of Pratt's book. The penetration of the domestic sphere by a beautiful Lady Strange, who is invited by a naive maiden, a motif that was then to be associated with vampires, is found in both works. Then Christabel stretched forth her hand O oh, well, bright dame, may you command the service of Sir Leoline. They crossed the moat, and Christabel took the key that fitted well. The lady sank, belike through pain, and Christabel, with might and main, lifted her, lifted her up, and were a weary weight over the threshold of the gate. Then the lady rose again, and moved as she were not in pain. And in the novel, in the short story, uh, halfway between, the stranger now rose and, leaning on Madame's arm, walked slowly over the drawbridge and into the castle gate. The scene is set in a similar schloss in Camilla, and the vampire, who is also faint, must likewise be supported to walk over the drawbridge and get through the gate. There are even verb verbal echoes between the lady rose again and the stranger now rose, and between over the threshold of the gate and over into the castle gate not to mention the Lady Strange and the Stranger. It is more specifically Laura's father who invites Carmilla and the governess, Madame Perrodon, who helps her cross the drawbridge, but Laura really insists that the stranger should stay with them. Laura's old father agrees out of chivalry, and it is likewise out of hospitality that Sir Leoline is not angry at Christabel for letting the beautiful stranger in. There is the same theme of chivalry, or honor, and hospitality endangered by those who take advantage of such values, or of peaceful civilization endangered or threatened by external chaos. Um, I'm skipping this, um, the physical uh, resemblance between uh, the characters, already noted by Nethercott. Um, 
<coughs> Sorry for that. We do not really know what kind of supernatural creature Geraldine is. A witch, a succubus, both are something else. For Nethercott, she's definitely a vampire. But there's nothing, uh, uh, we, we don't see her uh, using uh, her teeth and sucking, for instance. In his editorial notes, William Keach calls her a witch or evil spirit because there's a series of events that betray such a creature, if not to Christabel, at least to the reader three of which are reproduced by Le Fanu. According to a legend, Keech uh, notes, a witch cannot cross a threshold that has been blessed without assistance. This is what happens to both Geraldine uh, and Camilla with the drawbridge and gate. The second sign is the yelling of the dog. As I quote, animals are supposed to be able to sense the presence of an evil spirit in Christabel, in Christabel the mastiff old did not awake, yet she an angry moan did make. And what can ail the mastiff bitch? Never till now she uttered yell beneath the eye of Christabel. In the novel, it is the hunchback's dog that howls at Carmilla. Quote, his companion was a rough spare dog that followed at his heels, but stopped short suspiciously, suspiciously at the drawbridge, and in a little while began to howl dismally. Only the motif remains, though, as the situation is quite different, like the sex, race, race and provenance of the animal. And this is what a mastiff looks like. The third event is Geraldine's refusal to pray, although she pretends she wants to do it before going to bed. Praise we the Virgin, all divine, who hath rescued thee from thy distress. Alas, alas, said Geraldine, or Geraldine, uh, I cannot speak for weariness. In Camilla, Laura remarks, I, wondered, uh, I often wondered whether our pretty guest ever said her prayers. I certainly had never seen her upon her knees. In the morning, she never came down until long after our family prayers were over. And at night, she never left the drawing room to attend our brief evening prayers in the hall. Geraldine's weariness is even aggravated into hysteria when Laura starts singing a funeral hymn, which partly reveals Camilla's true face. Later on, the family modernizes and adapts this traditional motif of heresy to the more modern debate on religion inherited from the Enlightenment. To the statement that God made us all and will take care of us, she thus replies like an atheist, creator, nature, said the young lady in answer to my gentle father. Villains in Gothic literature are often used to express subversive ideas which the author may share or reject, calling them sophistry, because it is always safer to make such characters speak to them rather than the heroes and heroines. Carmilla just does that. It is quite ironic that a character created by superstition <coughs> should condemn religious superstition. But Shelley did the same in Queen Mab with the character of the Wandering Jew. Apart from the episode of the, of the hysteria and the transformation into a sooty black animal that resembled the monstrous cat in chapter five, or into the crawling and swelling black creature of chapter 14, Camilla retains a beautiful face and figure throughout the story. This is not the case of Geraldine, whose real body Christabel suddenly beholds, although Coleridge first refrains from describing what it is like. Behold a bosom, behold, sorry, behold a bosom and half a side, a sight to dream, not to tell. Oh, shield her, shield sweet Christabel. Now this is quite ambiguous. A sight to dream of could refer to overwhelming beauty and sex appeal, tempting Christabel into sapphic pleasure, which would account for the sin she thinks she has committed when she woke up. In the unpublished version, however, an additional line describes the bosom and side as lean and old and foul of hue. And when Christabel later beholds her father embracing Geraldine in the passage quoted above, again she saw that bosom old, again she felt that bosom cold. While the old body refers to the old hag in folk tales, the coldness and leanness suggest, suggest a revenant. Le Fanu prefers an animal appearance, the huge cat and more realistic tense looks during uh, Camilla's hysteria, although a lividness then likens her to a revenant as well. Um, Christabel and Laura also have a secret, and even when Christabel intends to disclose it, she does not reveal, reveal the whole truth. This secret is perhaps the most significant motif 
uh, connection between the two worlds. Christabel does not only invite Geraldine to seek protection in her old father's castle, but to sleep with her. Um, I beseech your courtesy, she tells the Lady Strange, this night to share your couch with me. Coleridge first describes them bo both undressing. Christabel's gentle limbs did she undress and lay down in her loveliness. Geraldine unbound the cincture from beneath the breast, her silk silken robe and inner vest dropped to her feet and lay down by the maiden's side and in her arms the maid she took. This is quite erotic and it is significant that Christabel watches Geraldine undressing. So halfway from the bed she rose and on her elbow did recline to look at Lady Geraldine. Coleridge explains that Christabel cannot sleep because, because of her tumultuous feelings, her thoughts of will and woe. And it is quite understandable to feel uneasy when sleeping with a stranger. However, her attitude suggests curiosity or to quote Laura, interest. And as she... Uh, um, as the archaic sense of the word will, meaning happiness, suggested a curiosity is not unalloyed alloyed with desire. Only what she glimpses, the cold old breast, is frightful. Despite that horrible sight, Christabel stays in the bed, as though she could not resist the spell which uh, uh, Geraldine is already casting on her. In the touch of this bosom there worketh a spell, which is lord of thy utterance, Christabel. Thou knowest tonight, and will know tomorrow, this mark of my shame, this seal of my sorrow. This silent spell is of course symbolical of the shame both ladies may feel for having touched one another. Laura likewise seems under a spell, first when she refuses to acknowledge her, or even Camilla's, homosexual longing or vampirism, and then when she does not tell the father that she suspects to have been bitten by a vampire. Le Fanu's choice of, of the breast as a seat or gate of infection is therefore not only inspired by the tapestry of Cleopatra in the room of um, uh, Carmilla, or even uh, the character Ianthe in Polydori's Vampire, uh, whose breast is mentioned. mentioned. It is also suggested by, um, or influenced by Geraldine's own contaminating bosom. Christabel is bitten by Geraldine's venomous breast, which curiously recalls the Mesopotamian Lamashtu again, um, I'm quoting uh, an inscription on an amulet, um, on a tablet. Let me put my breasts in your daughter's mouth, uh, because uh, the Lamashtu poisons the babies with uh, milk. The contamination of Christabel can be seen in a transformation in the next part of the poem, when she beholds the snake eyes of Geraldine. Um, yes. So deeply has had Christabel drunken in that look, those shrunken serpent eyes, that all her features were resigned to the sole image in her mind, and passively did imitate that look of dull and treacherous hate, and thus she stood in dizzy trance, still picturing that look sconce, which with forced and conscious sympathy. In this second part, there is, a, there is a shift. There are two parts in the poem. So in this second part, there is a shift from the breast, which Christabel might have sucked since she is described as a child in her mother's arms in the conclusion of part one, to the eyes from which she had drunken. The latter verb is not only metaphorical, but also metonymic. If not, uh, uh, sorry, in Camilla, it is the vampire who kisses Laura's breasts, which similarly causes her to turn, if not into a vampire, at least into a future corpse. I had grown pale, my eyes were dilated and darkened underneath, and the languor which I had long felt began to display itself in my countenance. Languid is indeed an adjective that usually refers to Carmilla. In Christabel, Christabel turns as it were into a snake-eyed lady since she imitates or sympathizes with the demon. Still, the contamination is less venereal or physiological than moral and emotional when waking up, Christabel exclaims, Sure, have I sinned! What sin can Christabel have committed? Does she simply refer to her imagining an ugly woman with sagging breasts instead of the beautiful lady she now sees getting up and so refreshed by a good night's sleep that, so it seems, a girded vest grows tight beneath her heavy breasts? Is it a sin to share a witch's bed or simply show her hospitality, as in segregationist societies? Or does she refer to her having sex with another woman 
thus betraying a betrothed knight for whom she had gone to pray in the first place in the woods. Is it a sin to have become unfaithful and above all a lesbian? Considering that that self-indicting speech, the cold old breast might in fact be a self-imposed vision, a delusion to condemn her attraction to what should be a beautiful orb, considering that Geraldine is elsewhere described as fair, so much so indeed as to arouse everyone in the poem, the mastiff bitch included. In that case, the contamination, Christabel's sympathy or imitation is simply like a coming out. This, is also, this also accounts for Laura's feeling of attraction and repulsion in Carmilla, blushing softly, softly. Uh, is this here? Yeah. Here. Um, blushing softly, gazing in my face with languid and burning eyes, and breathing so fast that her dress rose and fell with the tumultuous respiration. It was like the ardor of a lover. It embarrassed me. It was hateful and yet overpowering. Indeed, the whole vampire story might be Laura's invention to hide the plain, a plainer truth. Laura's secret thus reproduces Christabel's spell of secrecy. The breast is the site of contagion in both stories. Carmilla's entrance in the Schloss recalls Geraldine's in the castle. Both vic victims begin to turn, and there is a lesbian subtext. subtext. The premises are similar, but the rest... Uh, but I could carry on, uh, but I'm going to stop. And I would also show that there is more to this scene in Carmilla, especially the scene wh when um, the two uh, girls sleep together uh, in the beginning of the novel, uh, that somehow puts some distance between Le Fanu's novel and folklore and the Gothic tradition. For instance, there's a reminiscence of Jenner. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>